Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our class. Um, up here at the top before I launch the PowerPoint, I want to say that I am recording this the Sunday after the severe weather event in Texas. Um, some things to say about that. I'm actually not in Texas presently. I, for reasons I don't want to get into, am teaching at a distance this semester. And so it's been difficult for me to keep up with everything that's actually happening Texas-wise. There was not clear information on how things were doing, how things were going for the city of Denton. And realistically, I will have communicated to you by the time you watch this video about changes I made to the class. But for that week, the discussion post was made into extra credit. It is due on the day on the same week as the midterm, the same day as the midterm. It's five extra points. If for any reason things are still going strangely for you with all of that, please contact me. My email is in the syllabus. It's for the class. I'll work with you to try and make some accommodations so that you can still participate and get all, you know, get your education. But I get it. I've lived through some severe weather events before and it's not your fault, right? Uh, other than that, is there any, there are probably lots of things to talk about in terms of the ethics and science there, but it's not really the topic of this lecture. What I would say is that anybody blaming it on green energy doesn't understand green energy and that the real problem was probably the state of Texas refusing to prepare for a severe weather event. But we don't need to get into any of that. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about emergency preparedness because of my degree in outdoor leadership. But anyway, let's get into our lecture today. Share screen. And here we go. Let's launch the PowerPoint. Today, we are talking about legendary Jim Carrey's Liar Liar. Finally found a good movie poster for a joke here. Anyway, so really, we're talking about ethics and science. This is lecture 11. We are going to be comparing and assessing explanations of fraud. So first, what we'll do is we'll recap the readings, and then we'll kind of tie it together with last week's readings to draw out similarities, talk about what's common here for explanations of fraud. Hopefully, we can then understand fraud by outlining it because as we've seen, there are not very clear definitions here. So what happened in this Serge Strale article? And I hope I'm saying her name correctly. Um, so the story, and I will link a condensed sort of timeline version of it for you, is that a scientist named David Baltimore and his co-authors published this paper with pretty questionable data. And there was a student specifically a postdoc student. So she had her degree, but she was not, you know, official faculty. You know, she had a temporary position there. Noticed that things weren't quite right. First raised the problem to the people who wrote the paper. They told her to mind her business, think about her position, you know, things that you should not say when you're trying to prove that you haven't committed fraud. And, you know, so she raised it higher. The university they were at said, no, everything's up to snuff here. And it got published, right? And this led to more internal investigations and then a series of more investigations. The government got involved, Congress investigated, the Secret Service went through their notebooks. And over the course of many years, we had conflicting conclusions of, no, there was no fraud here. It's just sloppy bookkeeping and shouldn't have been done, but it's not a big deal because it happens all the time. To no, they fabricated their data and need to be called out for it and lose positions. And you know, what does it boil down to? What's the big point? That we can't find agreement on this distinguishing between questionable data as fraud or error. And what we know is that the data was recorded sloppily, right? That one of the people involved who was actually recording things for these experiments, and the specific experiment is not really, it's not something that matters here, but that they were recording data sometimes weeks after, which boils down to, well, how much do you trust that person's memory? The person who did that recording said, look, I know my science. I know my experiments. The data I have is correct. Others would say, well, then you should have recorded it in a correct manner, which is what comes down to it. Here is the importance of being right versus the importance of being earnest. More on that in a moment. You know, but this raises a question of who is it that's supposed to police science? Are we supposed to just allow you 
the individual universities to police themselves? Are we allowing the journals to be the arbiters of truth here? Did Congress need to be involved? Was this government overreach? You might say that you know, government needs to not be involved in what is and is not good science, but you might also say that this study received taxpayer funding, and so the American people, as represented by Congress, have a say in what becomes good science and what doesn't, because we're paying for it, right? And so it's it's messy. You know, there are two sides of that coin. It makes sense that there's some debate here. Uh, what the author of the article would say is that there are several considerations at play when assessing misbehavior, and they do say misbehavior and not fraud, because fraud was kind of the term that was used in these trials, and they want to kind of broaden the picture a little bit and say, well, fraud implies that they were lying on purpose, they're trying to mislead. And are they trying to mislead? Well, maybe not, right? Maybe we're not understanding their value system correctly. And so what are the considerations? First is the relevance to scientific knowledge. Is it correct? Is the claim that is being made in this particular paper, does it broaden scientific knowledge? Then relevance for general morality. And I think these, these are ranked, by the way, just in the way that science usually approaches something. You know, was this research conducted ethically? Is it, does it help us better understand ethics in the world? Are there people who have done something wrong and we need to correct? Um, and then finally, and this is the one that I think comes out in the most in this piece, is how is this misbehavior relevant for the public image of science? Because that's really the problem as people saw it was that this peek behind the curtain, this look at the sloppy research, it showed a public face, of, it showed to the public a face of science that science does not want to show which is that sometimes research is sloppy and gets published anyway. Sometimes questionable research gets published because the social systems are encouraging it. And so the big question is, well, what matters in science as a culture? You know, in other forms of research, we would call this, what are the implicit values of science? Is the value being right or is the value being earnest? You know, can you get the what the author of this piece calls the quick and dirty answer? You can get that published, and you should get that published faster, say most scientists, because the slow and you know make sure all your I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed, well, somebody's going to publish before you if you take your time. And so it's the race to publish versus ethics. And verifying other people's findings gains you nothing. So why follow up on it, right? Nobody makes a career, nobody wins a Nobel Prize by spending a lifetime checking other people's results. Moving on to Broad and Wade. So they make a couple of really interesting points and one that I find questionable right at the end. But before that, what do they say? They would say that it's not that we need to dismiss fraud. And that is what people have been doing up to this point. They would say, look, fraud happens, people are wrong. So what? But they would say that it's the, def it's the conventional ideology in science you know, that needs to be dismissed. And what do they mean by conventional ideology? They mean the social mechanisms around science. They don't mean the existence of the scientific method or a belief in truth. What they mean is these, a couple of different mechanisms, right? The careerism, which is that you care more about your career than you do about you know, the truthfulness of your research. We need to get rid of these research mills where there's one person on the top whose name is at the top of every paper, but realistically they're supervising others who are doing the real research. And that's kind of what happened in the Baltimore piece. Um, and then there's this race to publish that you got to get your name out there because publish or perish, your position at a university rides or dies on this. And that they would say all of this encourages fraud that as much as we have these ideals of truthfulness and you know common knowledge to everyone that what we are doing in terms of science the way that we are going about it is highly competitive it encourages people to cheat when they're students and it encourages people to cut corners on their research and by the way this has happened historically and there are some good historical examples that get named in both of the articles this week Isaac Newton kind of fudged his numbers because he knew he was correct. And look, we're still talking about Newton. We're still using Newtonian physics. 
And Gregor Mendel, you know, if you in high school in biology, you did the Punnett squares, you know, he also kind of fudged his data a little bit, but he's the father of modern biology, you know? So yeah, you might fudge your numbers a little bit, but if what you're saying is true, well, that's fine. You know, that's been standard practice. And what Broad and Wade would say is that, look, this all comes down to two conflicting desires. There's the desire for higher knowledge, to put new knowledge in the world, to better understand everything. And then there's the desire for success, that your career, you know, your notoriety as a scientist, that when that desire gets too high, it overtakes the other one. And that is how fraud comes about. Um, and what they would say is the presence of fraud reveals the problems of science as a community and as a methodology. And again, by methodology, they don't mean the scientific method as much as they mean the process of publishing, the way the university works. And there's some reason to that, right? Like we saw in the previous piece, we only replicate findings as a last resort. Nobody gets the prize for seeing that somebody else's experiment is correct. There's no credit in verifying someone else's work. And this idea that we need to be detached as much as it is a Mertonian norm is not something that's really practiced, right? You get into scientific research because you love scientific research. You don't get into it because you are so detached and you don't care about it. You just care about truth. It's no, I want my experiment to succeed, right? But when we publish something, we present detachment even though really we are presenting our research and we are hoping for our own success. And that then becomes kind of a problem. They would say science is first and foremost a social process. And if you want to reduce fraud, if you want to have science that is a little more truthful and nobody we're reading this week says we need to toss out science, right? They're saying that we want to reduce fraud. So how do you reduce fraud? Well, you change the social process. You make sure that the norms are changed, you know, the real norms, the ones that people are actually following. And you do that to reduce fraud. And they make some suggestions. We'll get into those in a minute. Um, some more main points is that science, when facing the public, presents itself as supreme rationality. And this is just not something that a human can truly live out because we are, in practice, emotional beings. Again, we care about our own success. We care about our research being right. And there is no journal of scientific failure. Maybe there should be. And so when science is presenting itself as supreme rationality, it becomes more of a public scandal when fraud becomes detected. And part of this is also the fact that public funding goes into it, right? Like, I don't think I've ever seen a government hearing where a philosopher is dragged in because they committed some kind of logical fallacy in their work. And why is that? Well, for one, it's not presenting itself as supreme rationality and the way, you know, the perfect way of understanding the world, but also government funding is not the norm. Um, and we kind of see this with the figures that we see as representing science, right? People that we probably admire or that it's okay to admire, you know, your Neil deGrasse Tysons and other folks who, when they come out, you know, they are representing science and we want to believe that what they're telling us is true. And in most cases, it is, right? You know, I watched Meet the Press this morning. Fauci was on, and I tend to believe things that Dr. Fauci says when he says them because he is a good scientist, and I can trust his words. But when there are cases of fraud, when those cases of fraud are quite public, that then lessens public trust in science. And so we do need to change these things because at times when it is critical that we listen to scientists we need to make sure that we can trust what they're saying. And this, I think, comes out a lot in the conversation around climate change and around COVID. That these are scenarios where people who are deniers, and as somebody who spent a semester studying climate denial, I can tell you one of their arguments is that, well, scientists commit fraud all the time. How do we know that they're not committing fraud now? And that is a hard thing to argue against. You know, there are some fallacies involved there, and the people making those arguments are not usually arguing in good faith, but the, uh, the argument is there, and it's calling public trust in science into question, which becomes a huge problem 
when lives and survival as countries and, and as a species are at stake, right? And so, Broad and Wade would say, it is imperative that we make these changes so that we continue to have public trust in the thing that is the cornerstone of our present society. Moving on. What do we do? We emphasize prevention over detection. And this is where they have their suggestions for how to prevent fraud in the future. And there are some smart ideas at play here and one that I'm a little wary of. It's thrown in right at the end. Um, so first, change the formal guidelines around publishing credit and responsibility. Makes total sense, right? That the people who did the most work, they should have their name at the top. In a merit-based system, that's how that should work. But right now we have a seniority-based system. And presently, the person whose name is at the top of the paper is usually the person least familiar with the research. And yet they are the one who bears the responsibility, gets all the credit, it's an imperfect system, right? We should change that. Uh, next one is to end the pra practice of shingled articles. Shingled articles are when you do one study and you publish as many papers as you can out of it, you know, overlapping your data, making your number of publishing credits a lot wider so that you can get better grants, better funding, better jobs. You know, it, it is done purely to advance your own career. It's not to advance the knowledge, right? If the concern is to advance the body of knowledge we all have, well, then what we should be doing is just, you did a study, publish your findings on the study, even if you got something wrong, and then you're done with it. You move on to the next thing or you study it in a different way. Next suggestion is to reduce the number of journals. We would do this so that we have journals that are good and are trusted and only the best research gets published instead of this current mad dash to publish wherever you can. And well, if you can't get published in this journal, eventually you'll just keep hitting submit till somebody takes you, right? Even if your work is bad, you can always publish in a predatory journal. Um, and then another one would be to reduce the, sorry, reform the federal grant system where, you know, public money is going into this. We want to make sure that what's being studied is useful for the public, makes complete sense. And then the last one, and this is a pretty sticky point, is to reduce the number of working scientists because, as they say, you know, there's the few elite scientists that produce the relevant work, and then there's everybody else. And that one is uh, a little suspect to me, especially because they go on to say, well, really, you could remove public funding entirely and just have everyone be beholden to private interest. And, you know, they talked about, you know, capitalist enterprise earlier. and without getting into an economic argument, it seems, that seems a bridge too far. That if science is to be a public good, it should be funded publicly. That's my two cents, you are free to disagree. But I do, at the end, like their definition of science as man's understanding of nature. That instead of making it, you know, these claims to supreme truth, it is, this is our understanding and it is our present understanding of how nature being, you know, the mechanics of material reality, it's our present understanding of how it works. And we can be wrong, and then we can course correct because it is our understanding, it is not supreme truth. Anyway, moving on. So let's try to tie together last week's readings and this week's readings. I'm going to give you the highlights, and then we'll try and pull together for commonalities. Um, in terms of assessment, what I'm doing here is, a, you know, this is a, a paring down of what's here. And in a later discussion post, I will have you do the assessing. There is no discussion post this week, so that does get a little sloppy. I'll push things around to make sure it works. But this is a kind of scenario where if we were together in class, we would divide into groups and we do the assessment together. You can't do that because we're over distance and realistically, the week that I'm recording this, some of you probably don't have power to get on Zoom with me anyway. And that's okay. So first, Briggle and Mitchum, our textbook for the course. What do they say here about fraud? They would say there's a spectrum between good scientific practice and questionable research practice. You know, and it's very much a virtue system there, right, where you have the virtue on one side and the vice on the other. And any given scientific study is going to fall somewhere between the two of those and that hard and fast rules don't work for a scenario like this. 
they would also say that this definition of paring down questionable research practice to just fraud fabrication and plagiarism is pretty narrow, um, especially because, well, what qualifies as fraud, right? We saw in this week's readings. Uh, it's kind of a gray area, right? They would say fraud at least falls into this deviation from Mertonian norms and that big science encourages fraud, right? We talked about that last week that these large systems, there's low accountability, there's low communication, there's high competition. And how is that not going to lead to fraud? We're really just trusting people to be more altruistic than the average person because they're more educated and that has led to some problems. And there's these problems of credit and competition that we are presently encouraging questionable practices and it's remarkable we don't have more fraud. Then there's this fostering integrity and in research piece, which I thought was really good. It laid out a system to have less fraud, you know, ways to reduce, right? And I, they had all these lists of values and norms and you know trends, and I don't want to go over that again because we had a lecture on that, but we are you know naming what's here, right? And so what do they say? They say science is a cornerstone of modern society. Fraud is a threat to society because it calls the basis of what we have into question. And science has largely failed to define and respond to, to con misconduct because the belief has been that what is wrong will be discarded in the process of scientific research. The problem, of course, is that we are human. Stuff doesn't always get discarded. You know, people who are just particularly charming, their research might not get questioned for years. And that, again, fraud is encouraged by certain trends in modern science, be it the way the university works or the way that publishing works or just the emergence of digital technology. There are some things that have been uncritically adopted. How do we prevent it? Well, by the adoption of and, here and, and adherence to these core values that they list. And that, that is a pretty good list of values that they have, you know, if I'm going to offer personal comment. No list of values is ever perfect, but those, as somebody who has worked in different organizational systems, you do want to have something to aspire to, and those are pretty good values to aspire to. Um, and then we have this week's readings. We have Sergistral, Sergistrale, I'm not sure. Um, she would say fraud comes from an overemphasis on being right rather than being earnest, that the moral considerations aren't often taking place until afterwards, that these that heavy competition, it encourages quick and dirty science versus the slower, more methodical, you know, what we think of as the scientific method is in reality not often actually practiced because it is a race to get published. There's no incentive to correct your own errors because you don't want to undermine your own career and that the oversight bodies we have in science are just not functioning properly. Uh, Broad and Wade would say that competition, research mills, and careerism encourage fraud on a social level, that it is the social problems of science that encourage fraud and not the actual scientific method or the concept of science itself. It is, it is an entirely social problem. Um, so what are some commonalities here? Everyone seems to agree that there is something flawed in the social systems of science. Everyone seems to agree that competition has not encouraged good scientific practice. That realistically, what, what should be happening is collaboration, but instead we have this competitive effort and that competitive effort has not led to better science. It has led to quicker science. There's also no glory in verifying or proving or checking others' research. Um, one of the best suggestions I saw in all of this was the suggestion of a journal of scientific failure where you could still gain some credit for doing the good science of putting out the discoveries of how things don't work, that that could broaden the understanding of what science is by helping us see the borders. And, you know, other forms of inquiry, other disciplines actually do this. You know, the theologians would call it negative theology, where you say, okay, this, here are statements that are not true. And by understanding what is not true, you might gain a better understanding of what is true. You can you can color in the outside of the image instead of the inside. 
Uh, the other problem is that the average scientist is not thinking of ethics when doing or evaluating research. Like we said, those ethical considerations usually happen afterwards. And that does become quite a problem when something does go wrong, because since science is held to these high standards by the public, it then becomes a scandal. And finally, what seems to be clear to me in all of these is that the definitions and boundaries are not very clear and not, are not as clear as they could be for what is good scientific practice, what's questionable practice, and what is fraud. That, you know, if we had just cut and, di cut and dry definitions of this, we wouldn't need a class about ethics and science. We would have just a little handbook and you could follow it. And if you followed all the rules, you knew you'd be good. But life is quite a bit messier than that. So that is going to be the end of this lecture. What's next? I'm going to go record a short video about the midterm. Please watch it. It is not required, but I do give you the essay question for the midterm in there. So if you want it early, please watch that video. Take the quiz for module four that is due on March 7th. I'll get it out as early as possible and take the midterm. It goes up on March 1st and is due on March 7th. With that, thank you all for joining me with this. I hope you have a great day. I hope that you, by the time you watch this, have working power, have working water. And uh, yeah, have a good day. And I'm going to go record that video about the midterm. All right. See ya.